Hi, in this video we are going to continue with our functional group chemistry. Um, so here we will start by looking at the haloalkanes. Okay? Now, first of all, haloalkanes, the general formula is CnH2m plus 1x. Alright? Again, you don't have to memorize all the general formulas. All you have to memorize is the one for alkane and the rest of them you are able to deduce um, from the general formula of alkane. So here, now think about it. Again, I try to use uh, a very simple alkane. Uh, we have CH4, which is methane, right? So this one is CH4. Now, if you try to introduce uh, a halogen into the compound, then what we're going to do is we need to get rid of one hydrogen atom and then we will plug in an halogen okay so that would be the halo alkane the halogen could be chlorine, bromine, iodine, fluorine right now you notice um, if you take away a hydrogen atom if you again look at the general formula this one, CNH2M plus 2, right? If you take away a hydrogen atom, that will make the general formula CNH2M plus 1, right? You take away a hydrogen atom, and then you plug in the halogen, therefore having the general formula CNH2M plus 1X, okay? Now, of course, in, uh, in, in the real situation, if you know the halogen, then you should put down the corresponding halogen. So don't just put down X. Okay? Now this general formula is to represent the homologous series halo alkanes. Okay, a more collectively, more general, more general general formula. Okay. Alright, so um, here some basic information probably you need to know. Uh, the functional group is the halo group and uh, bear in mind, uh, if they ask you to a functional group, don't just say chlorine, bromine, iodine, right? Those are the elements, but not the functional group. So, if they ask you what functional group it is, you should put down floral group, chloral group, bromo group, something like that. Now, some general remarks about haloalkanes. So, low carbon haloalkane exists as colorless gas or volatile liquid. Actually, it depends on which halogen it has because um, when you have larger halogen atoms such as iodine and bromine, note the huge size of the atom makes the whole molecule very large, which of course result in a stronger van der Waals force and therefore having a higher boiling point and probably in that case it will exist as a liquid. However, if it has uh, a smaller halogen atom, for example, chlorine or fluorine, then um, they will probably exist as gas. So, uh, for example, if you have a coral methane, okay, coral methane, then coral methane is a gas, all right? Uh, when you have uh, iodine methane, uh, this one I'm not so sure, but uh, that one would probably have, uh, exist as a liquid. And at least I would expect to see iodine methane having a higher boiling point than coral methane. Right? And some of you may already recall that uh, coral methane, well, it's a gas, but if you have three chlorine atoms instead of one chlorine atom, that would give us CHCl3, which is chloroform. And chloroform is obviously a liquid. Okay? This is. Uh, how the size of the molecule is related to the boiling point and therefore related to the physical property. Okay, and also for a halo alkane, it's quite different from alkane and alkene. Uh, halo alkane, they have lower flammability uh, because they are carrying the halogens and the halogen are usually more electronegative than carbon and therefore having more halogen will make the carbon more oxidized 
And always remember, combustion is the oxidation of carbon of organic compound. Therefore, if the carbon is pretty much oxidized at the first place, it will make it more difficult to be further oxidized and uh, that will make it more difficult to undergo combustion. Uh, also, another reason why is that um, the number of hydrogen atoms is much fewer when you have more and more halogen atoms. But anyway, all you need to know, all you need to know is halo alkane uh, does not undergo combustion that much when compared to alkane and alkene. All right. Now, here, this is something that you need to know before we move on to the properties and reaction. Now, halo alkane and later on alcohol, uh, we need to know how to classify different types of halo alkane based on the number of AQ substituents. Okay? This is very important, especially when we talk about alcohol. Okay? Now, let's have a look. Now we have four types of halo alkanes, and you can basically tell they are different from each other by the number of red AQ groups attached to the carbon where the halogen is also attached to. Okay? Now, so if you look at this one, okay, this one you will see uh, there are one AQ group attached to the halo carbon. So this one is referred to as primary halo alkane. Similar idea goes for here. Uh, it has two AQ groups, the red one, attached to the halo carbon. So it is considered as the secondary halo alkane. And this one with three of them that would give us a tertiary halo alkane. And this one, uh, when there is no AQ substituent, that would only be one possibility, which is methyl. And we will call this one a methyl halo alkane. So um, you need to also pay attention uh, to one thing is that no matter it is a methyl or ethyl or whatever it is, uh, they are all considered as one AQ substituent. Okay? So it is important that you know which type of halo alkane um, uh, for, uh, it belongs to. Okay? So bear in mind. <coughs> now, for physical property, uh, as you can see from here, like I said, uh, all halogens or even all organic compounds are mole molecules, so they all have simple molecular structure and physical properties all depends on the intermolecular force. Now, you notice halo alkane, the halogens are quite electronegative, so you will expect to see uh, asymmetrical. Asymmetrical halo alkanes are polar. Okay? Now, you remember, uh, in order to be polar, not only do you need to have a polar bonds, but you also have to be asymmetrical. So, if you have something like this, if you have like uh, something like this, okay, now even though uh, fluorine is very, very electronegative, but the whole molecule is symmetrical, which makes it non-polar as well. So, here, uh, we try to focus on the uh, we try to do a comparison with all these asymmetrical LK. Now, you may notice, okay, uh, fluorine should be the most electronegative one and RD should be the least. So, uh, CH3F should be the most polar molecule among uh, the four molecules. Then you may able to say that um, <coughs> the Van de Waals force is the strongest for uh, fluoromethane simply because uh, it has the most polar bond. Now, while it is partly correct, um, you also have to pay attention to the fact that uh, when the Wilds force is not only determined by the polarity, but it also determined by the molecular size. Actually, this is what I just mentioned in the first place. Um, when we compare CH3Cl and CH3I, um, I said that CH3I is probably a liquid, whereas CH3Cl is a gas. Uh, the reason why I make this prediction is that 
uh, CH3i here is much larger in size because of the RD, right? And <clears throat> this is the reason why uh, I will predict that CH3i is actually uh, a liquid quake. Okay, hold on. Okay, so um, down here, what I'm trying to illustrate to you is, in this case, uh, we have a contradicting factor. Okay, if you look at the polarity of the molecules, then I try to use two extreme or two extreme case. Um, you know, CH3F should be higher than CH3I, but when we look at the molecular size, all right, then CH3I is bigger than CH3F. So it turns out that okay, uh, the two factors sort of contradicting one another uh, so what would be the end result now if you ask me uh, if a situation like this happens uh, I actually don't know I actually don't know so um, it turns out that the size matters more than the polarity so if you look at this diagram you can tell the size the, the factor of a larger molecular size outweighs the factor of being more polar. So it turns out that uh, size matter more. Okay. So here I'm trying to put down here the molecular size increase from RF to RI. Now R is representing the AQ groups, so uh, that you can take it as uh, CH3F and CH3I. Uh, so when the size increases, so the intermolecular wave devolves force also increases and note that the wave devolves force attributed by the size of the halogen outweighs that of the polarity. So this one is to, well, sort of like, uh, what do we call, um, the horse uh, behind the cannon, huh? you, you get it, right, the, 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 Chinese, the Chinese chess, huh? the horse behind the cannon. Huh? Now, because we already know the trend based on the graph, so I would be safe to say that, oh, size matter more than polarity. But what I'm trying to say is, if you don't have this data and you randomly give me some unknown organic compound uh, with different size and also different polarity of which they contradict with one another, and then you ask me which one matter more, to be honest, I don't know. But here, this particular case, with all the information given and with my own knowledge, I'm able to put down this thing. Okay? And uh, here, so for halo alkanes, they, uh, they dissolve in polar solvent rapidly. Uh, only very slightly soluble in water, despite of being polar. Um, so this is just a fact. Okay? Most of them dissolve in uh, organic solvent. Okay? <coughs> now, chemical property. So there is a uh, small remarks, it's not very important, but uh, I try to explain why halo alkane is uh, not the most reactive one, but it has some reactivity. Now, the reason is because of the halogen uh, being more electronegative, so it will result in a, a, a considerable amount of partial charges or dipole, and that will make the carbon bearing uh, quite a significant partial positive charge. So if there is any electron-rich species, such as high hydroxide ion, now why is it electron-rich? You can tell because with a negative charge, right? With a negative charge. If you are negative, probably you are quite electron-rich. So these negative charged species may attack the carbon, the partial positively charged carbon. So um, this is the reason why halo alkane uh, is considered reactive, not the most reactive one, but you know, this is the reason accounting for its reactivity. Okay. Now, uh, let's look at the reaction. Actually, for halo alkane, we only got one reaction, which is substitution. Substitution. Sounds familiar, right? Um, which homologous series also undergoes substitution reaction? Well, it has to be alkane, right? Alkane. But for alkane, uh, they undergo a free radical substitution reaction, but here free radical is not included. But you always remember 
substitution, the meaning of substitution is that one atom or uh, groups of atoms are replaced by another atoms or another groups of atoms. Okay, so always remember that. <coughs> so here uh, we have the uh, halo LK and then it reacts with a hydroxide ion. Basically, they are exchanging or replacing one another and therefore forming an alcohol plus a halide -like ion. A halide -like ion. Okay? Now, an example here, we have one chloropropane reacting with sodium hydroxide. So this uh, substitution reaction occurs, resulting in the formation of propane one mole and um, the sodium chloride. Okay, so you see how the groups are exchanging, are exchanging, okay? Uh, the sodium ion here is a spectator ion, but uh, you know, uh, it's okay to put that way in the equation as well. Okay, now for this reaction, we have some remarks you need to know. Um, first of all, this reaction, okay, halo alkane, can actually react with water to form alkano, right, to form alcohol. But the reaction is quite uh, slow, simply because the halo alkane, like I said, uh, not very much dissolves in water, and if it exists as a liquid, then the two liquids will be invisible. So um, the, the, the reaction could only take place uh, in between the two interfaces, uh, which is pretty much slow. Uh, also, water is not particularly reactive when compared to sodium hydroxide. So usually the reaction we carry out using dilute sodium hydroxide solution. Okay, so please bear in mind the reagent that we use. Okay, now the second thing is that uh, you notice for well, this reaction, this substitution reaction, in order to take place, you must cut the CCL bond or you cut the CX bond, right? Before you can do uh, substitution or the replacement. Right? So, uh, therefore, whether or not the reaction can be fast or slow will be pretty much depends on how easy or difficult you cut the CX bond. Okay? If the CX bond is weaker, then it will be easier to break. So the reaction could be faster. Okay? So the question is, uh, which CX bond? Is it CF, CCL, CPL, or CI? Which bond is the weakest? Now, actually, if you look at this diagram, then it will be very obvious. Now, always remember, the bond length is uh, reversely proportional to the bond strength. Okay. In other words, uh, the longer the bond length, the weaker the bond strength. Always remember this one. Okay? And if you have a larger halogen atom, obviously you will have a longer bond length and therefore weaker bond strength. So this one is the weakest and this one is the strongest. So if it has the weakest bond, it is easier to it is the easiest to break and therefore okay, easiest to break. Okay, and therefore fastest reaction. Okay, so this is the idea. So this is one of the factors that affects the rate of reaction uh, when we talk about substitution of halo LK by sodium hydroxide. Okay, so that's the idea. All right. So let's have a look at a practice question. Um, Again, pause the video and try to attempt these questions. Okay, so let's check. Um, here, sodium hydroxide and one chloropropane, of course, it will form propane one mole. Okay, substitution reaction. Okay. Um, here, B, uh, this one is a 1,2-dibromal uh, propane with sodium hydroxide. Uh, of course, it will undergo substitution reaction with both 
chromine atom. So that will result in the formation of propane 1,2 diol. Okay, propane 1,2 diol. Okay, that should be obvious as well. Oh, by the way, uh, I missed something because here, determine the products. So it does not specify organic products. That means even in organic products like uh, sodium chloride, we need to uh, we need to we need to also write it down. So let's put down as well sodium chloride and uh, sodium bromide. Okay. Now, but it does not need to uh, be balancing equation because these are not equations, right? These are not equations. So we don't have to balance it. All we need to know is to show um, the chemical nature of the products, okay? Now here, C, um, this time we have limited sodium hydroxide, and in this case, we have two different halogens. So which one will react? Now, supposedly, if you do not have the word limited, then I will have both halogen substituted. However, if the question stated very clearly that you have limited dilute sodium hydroxide solution, then we will have to think, okay, which one? Is it the C, Cl or the Ci react faster? The one react faster should be undergoing substitution more preferentially than the one that reacts slower, okay? So it turns out that it is um, the Ci bond, right, the Ci bond, uh, should be easier to be broken, right? So here, um, we will have uh, our major product. Like this, that's for the sodium iodide, okay? Because like I said, CI bond is the weakest, so it should react faster, okay? Lastly, we have this one, okay, with a call, green, and an alkene. So, of course, you will expect to see the call, green, and the substitution reaction. But uh, is there any reaction with uh, alkene? So, does alkene undergo some reaction with sodium hydroxide? So, it turns out, no, it doesn't, okay. Alkene does not react with sodium hydroxide. Um, one way to think about it is that uh, you remember the reason why CC double bond is reactive is because of the high electron density between the two carbons, right? And this high electron density will attract something positive to react with it. However, for sodium hydroxide, it is the negative hydroxide ion that is actually the reactant, right? So, do you think a negative hydroxide ion? Uh, will be likely to react with somewhere with a lot of electron as well? Of course not. The negative and negative repelled. So this is the reason why um, sodium hydroxide does not react with an uh, alkene. Right? So only the Cl will be replaced it by the hydroxide ion. So the product would be this one and sodium chloride. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, now question two here. Now this is a tricky question, question two. Now which of the following correctly, correctly describe the expected reaction rate when the following reactors are allowed to react with sodium hydroxide? So now the first one is uh, bro bromoalkane, it's a bromoalkane and here is a chloroalkane. Right, so bromine should be uh, the CBr bond should be weaker than the CCr bond, and therefore this one should be break, broken easier, and therefore faster reaction. So we should know uh, two should be slower than one. Okay, at least we know this. But the question is, what about three here? Hey, this is not a halo alkane, right? So. Would that be no reaction at all, right? If that is the case, if you expect to see no reaction, then the answer would be three to one, right? Three to one. However, if you are smart, if you pay extra attention, this one is actually benzoic acid. This is benzoic acid. 
And what is so important is that benzoic acid is an acid, and sodium hydroxide is a base. So what happens when you put acid and base together? They will undergo neutralization, right? Neutralization. And neutralization, is it a fast reaction or a slow reaction? Of course, it is a very fast reaction. Okay? Therefore, actually, benzoic acid reacts the fastest. The fastest. Okay? No matter what uh, halogen you have, um, neutralization must be faster than the two reactions. So the answer would be 2, 1, 3. The answer should be B. Okay? So it's quite a tricky question, but should be within your knowledge right now. Okay? So that would be halo alkane. You realize uh, there is only one reaction, um, but it is a useful reaction because you can change uh, halo alkane to alcohol. Right? And you know, halo alkane can also be produced from alkane and alkene, if you remember. Then it, it kind of creating uh, what we call a synthetic root. Uh, later on you will, you, will, you will learn about it. So now, right now, you are able to uh, already uh, describe how you can change an alkane to an alcohol. Right? Before you don't know, right? Before you don't know how to change an alkane into alcohol. But right now, for alkane, you can perform a free radical substitution to form a halo alkane, and then we do a substitution reaction forming alcohol, right? Now, I, I just want you to, uh, you know, bit by bit, try to, um, you know, build up this sense of how the functional group and how the harmonic series can change from one another. And at the end, at the end, you will have to utilize all this knowledge and uh, design how to convert organic compound A into organic compound B, right? So stay tuned until uh, we reach that part. Now, we move on to another box, big box, alkano. Now, uh, so far, we have talked about alkane, alkene, and halo alkanes, right? So um, alkane, we have, well, let's, let's see if you count uh, combustion as a reaction, if you do not count combustion as a reaction, then alkane we have one reaction, which is substitution reaction. For alkene, we could say we have two reactions. Um, one is the addition reaction, another one is the uh, substitution reaction. Sorry, what am I talking about? Alkene has two reactions, okay? One is addition reaction, another one is addition polymerization, okay? And for halo alkene just now, Halo alkene has one reaction, the substitution reaction. So, so far, for different homologue series, we are talking about one to two reactions. But here, alkanos, how many reactions do we have? Huh? We have actually four, four reactions. So that's why this is the main dish. Uh, this is one of the main dishes. Okay? We, need to, we need to spend more time talking about alkano. Okay? So, let's get started. So first of all, the general formula. CNH2M plus 1 OH. Um, again, the, the, the general formula you can derive from alkane simply using this method, okay, just like halo alkane, but this time you add the OH rather than add X, okay? But bear in mind, okay, you may ask, hey, sir, I am good at math, okay? You see the H here. Can I, can I put it this way? Can I put it this way? Huh? Because you know hydrogen can also be grouped up here, right? The answer is no, this is wrong, okay? The reason is because the general formula, uh, for general formula, you need to specify the functional group. That means you need to particularly isolate the functional group from the carbon skeleton and write it at the back of the general formula. So you can't put it this way. Okay, you can't put it this way. <coughs> now the functional group, again, pay attention. Um, for alkanos or alcohol, a lot of students, when they are asked about the functional group, they will put down alcohol group. But alcohol group is not acceptable. You must put down hydroxyl group. 
hydroxyl group. Okay. Now, general remarks. Um, so, low carbon alcohols are colorless and they are volatile liquids. Okay. <clears throat> now, you may notice. Um, uh, we'll talk about it later. Okay. Now, similar to haloalkane, we can classify alcohol into three or four categories based on the number of AQ groups attached to the hydroxyl carbon. Um, like I said, this one you need to know much better than uh, haloalkane because um, actually later on when we talk about the reaction of alcohol, uh, different uh, types of alcohol actually react differently. Okay. Now. <coughs> Um, so let's talk about physical property. Now for alcohol, you may notice the presence of hydroxyl group makes it highly polar, so polar that they can actually form hydrogen bond. This is the reason why for alcohol, even the first member, methanol, is already existing as a liquid. Okay, so all the alcohols, uh, except for the very large one, they are all liquids. Okay, and when compared to other uh, organic substance, they are usually having higher boiling point, higher viscosity, okay, because of the hydrogen bond. Now, please make sure you know how to illustrate the formation of hydrogen bond between the alcohol molecules themselves and also between alcohol and water molecules, okay. Make sure you know how to illustrate the formation of hydrogen bond, okay. Now, <clears throat> you may also notice alcohol is miscible with water. It's able to mix with water pretty well. The reason is because they can also form hydrogen bond with water molecules. Okay? However, the miscibility decreases as the number of carbon increases because when you have more and more carbon, then if you look at the alcohol molecule as a whole, um, the intermolecular force will be dominated by the wear the wells force from the, from the carbon skeleton rather than from the hydroxyl group. So that actually applies to most uh, all the homologous series is that when the number of carbon increases, then the molecules, the intermolecular force of the entire molecules will be dominated by the long hydrocarbon chain rather than the functional group itself. So here, as the number of carbon increases, when the wells force predominate with longer chain, making the intermolecular force uh, of alkano molecules less comparable to that of water molecules. Okay. All right, uh, and then yeah, there is one uh, special uh, feature about ethanol because uh, for ethanol. You have the hydroxyl group very polar, able to uh, mix with water pretty well. But at the same time, ethanol has the uh, hydrocarbon part that is relatively non-polar and therefore able to uh, accommodate into certain non-polar solvent. So uh, it will mix certain alcohols such as ethanol a co-solvent, meaning that it can dissolve in both polar and non-polar solvent. So um, I'm not sure if you uh, heard about, for example, um, some alcohol spirits like whiskey, like brandy. Um, why do people like to drink it a lot? Probably you don't because you, you can't taste it right now. It's, you know, you're under 18 years old. Um, but like why a lot of people are so obsessed with whiskey and brandy like myself is because those alcoholic spirits have a high percentage of alcohol, you know, the ethanol, right? And <clears throat> actually, a lot of flavor compound, that means compound with a lot of flavors, they are actually organic compounds, plus they are usually not very polar. Now, if you want to have a very flavorable drinks, think about it, if you want to have a very flavorable drinks, so your drinks should be able to dissolve as much flavor compound as possible, right? The more the flavor compound inside your drinks, the more flavorful it is, right? That makes sense. But like I said, most of the flavor compounds 
are actually non-polar or not very polar. So they can't really dissolve in water that much. Okay? But think about whiskey, brandy, 40% of ethanol. Ethanol is, uh, can work as a cold solvent, allowing more and more flavor compound dissolve into the uh, alcoholic spirit. That will pretty much makes it very flavorful, very powerful in flavor. And this is also the reason why a lot of people like to drink whiskey, brandy, because of that you know, powerful flavor or packed up in that small glass. Okay, I'm not trying to say too much because otherwise probably people would say I'm trying to persuade you guys to drink. Uh, I mean, uh, make a decision once you are above 18 years old. Okay, I'm not uh, advising you to try. Okay, don't try. Okay, let's move on to the chemical properties. So um, here we have uh, Oh, actually, I, I put down four reactions, but actually there's one. Um, yeah, later on, you may know. There is a reaction uh, that exists between alcohol and carboxylic acid. So it could be classified as a reaction of alcohol. It can also be classified as a reaction of carboxylic acid. So, um, yeah, depending on how you see it. Anyway, the, uh, there are four reactions in this case. we we'll start with combustion. Now, you should have... Um, Based on your common sense, you should know alcohol is pretty good for burning, right? Because you know, before we have um, alcohol lamp, right? When you burn the alcohol uh, in alcohol lamp, it gives you a pretty clean, blue, steady flame, right? So alcohol is pretty good for burning, okay? Now, you may ask, okay, why burning Alcohol will give you such a clean uh, blue flame. Huh? Whereas usually when we talk about burning alkane, alkene, they will give us like the yellow sooty flame. But here it always gives you the blue clean flame. The reason is because if you look at the hydroxyl group, there is a oxygen atom. And the oxygen atom can support complete combustion. Okay? Um, however, the combustion of alcohol, despite of being very clean, it does not really uh, release a lot of heat. So uh, this is also the reason why you, you, you seldom use alcohol as a fuel for cooking. Okay, you usually use town gas. But the reason is because the alcohol, first of all, is more expensive, and secondly, it is not giving out sufficient heat for uh, for cooking. Um, the reason why it releases less heat is again because the alcohol is more oxidized in the first place. Uh, it has an oxygen atom in the compound, which makes the whole compound or the carbons are more oxidized in the first place. Okay? Now, so combustion. The only thing I want to talk about here is when you do the balancing equations. Usually, students will make a mistake by forgetting to include the oxygen atom here. Now, because before, usually, uh, we tackle the oxygen atom at last, once we balance off the carbon and hydrogen atom, and usually, we will look into the total number of oxygen atoms in the carbon dioxide and water, and then we try to manipulate the mole ratio of the oxygen, and that's it, right? But right now, alcohol, you see, boom, there is an extra oxygen atom in the organic compound. So when you are balancing, especially when you're considering the oxygen atom on both sides of the equation, you make sure don't forget the oxygen atom in the hydroxyl group. Okay? Now, let's move on to another part, which is the substitution reaction. Now, this part could be a little bit complicated. Now, uh, but don't worry, don't worry. I will talk about it, but at the end, I will let you know what you must know and something not very important. Okay? Now, here, for alkano, the hydroxyl group can be substituted by halide ion to form haloalkane. So it's quite like the opposite of haloalkane, right? The haloalkane, just now, uh, we learned about how to uh, substitute, how to replace the halogen by hydroxyl group forming alcohol. 
But here, we are just trying to do the reverse, right? We try to convert the alcohol back to a haloalkane, right? So, but the reaction, the condition, uh, the reagent is pretty much different, okay? So let's have a look. Now, we can have two uh, types of reagents in order to achieve the substitution reaction. Um, here, we can use hydrogen halide. That makes sense, okay? Uh, it can provide the halide ion to substitute the hydroxyl group. Now, uh, but it depends on which halide, which halide are we trying to introduce into the alcohol. Now, if you want to produce um, coral alkane, coral alkane, okay? If you try to uh, produce the coral alkane, then what we try to do is to add con sulfuric acid, sorry, con hydrochloric acid, okay? And it does not require heating. Once you add it inside, you sort of uh, shake it, okay? And then it will produce one coral propane, which is immiscible in water, and therefore it will float at the top, okay? You should see two layers, okay? You should see two layers of liquid. Then later on, you can either use a syringe to remove it, or you can later on use something called separating funnel. Uh, later, you will learn about that to separate the two layers of liquids, okay? So uh, the equation, not too difficult, huh? Substitution reaction, okay? However, to prepare bromoalkane, uh, we need to have some special treatment. So here, we will have the alcohol, heated with potassium bromide and concentrated sulfuric acid. Um, the reason is because HBr is unlike HCl. HCl is much more stable, but HBr not quite stable. Okay, so we need to prepare in situ. Now, what do you mean by prepare in situ? Okay, this is a very important phrase in chemistry. Um, prepare in situ. In situ means at the place at the place. Um, the idea is, think about it, okay? Like I said, HBr is not stable, okay? So unlike hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid, you can prepare hydrochloric acid, and then you pour it into the uh, alcohol and accomplish the reaction, okay? But HBr cannot, because once you prepare the HBr, okay? Before you can pour it into the alcohol, the HPL start to decompose, start to uh, undergo oxidation to form bromine and something else. So that makes the HPL unable to prepare um, separately and then, in, and then used as a reagent. So what do we do? What we do is we will prepare the HPL at the place where the alcohol also exists. So that once the HBr is formed, it is already next to the alcohol and they can react immediately, okay? So whenever HBr is formed, it is quickly reacts with alcohol, then we can solve the problem for HBr being highly unstable and, and therefore decompose um, into something else. So this is the concept of prepare in situ. Prepare the reagent at the place where the reaction takes place. Okay, so this is the idea. Um, so, yeah, this one, that means, in situ means uh, in the place where the reaction occurs. Okay, so, uh, so what we do is we have the alcohol and then we heat it with potassium bromide and corn sulfuric acid. Now, and there are two reactions. First of all, the reaction takes place between KBr and sulfuric acid. So you know uh, sulfuric acid is able to uh, Acidify basically to give the H plus to KBr forming HBr. Okay, now bear in mind this is not a redox reaction. What we're trying to do is to um, 
give the H plus to the KBR and forming HBR. Liberating K plus, it joins to the uh, hydrogen sulfate ion. Okay. Anyway, so once you form HBr, then HBr can immediately react with the alcohol and accomplish, accomplishing the substitution reaction. Okay. Now down here, there are some remarks saying that uh, why we have to do this. This is basically what I said. Corn hydrobromic acid readily oxidizes in air to form bromine. Therefore, HBr must be prepared in situ. Okay. Now, so for coral alkane, we use uh, coral hydrochloric acid. For uh, bromo alkane, we will use this prepared in situ method using KBr and uh, coral sulfuric acid uh, prepared in situ. Then, what about if I want to make an iodine alkane? Now, for iodine alkane, we can't even use this method. Now, think about it. Um, if HBr will be readily uh, oxidized to bromine in air, then HI should be even more readily oxidized into iodine in air. Simply because iodine, if you remember, is a stronger uh, reducing agent than Br minus, right? So if Br minus uh, already highly unstable, HI should be even more unstable. So so unstable HI. Is so unstable such that even the prepared in situ doesn't work. So that makes this uh, method okay only applicable for making RCl and RBr. Okay, so this method can only used to make. RCL, RBR uh, from alcohol. Okay, now you may ask, hey, sir, what about floral alkane? Floral alkane. Uh, can I use hydrofluoric acid for this reaction? Um, now, there is something special about fluorine. Uh, you won't see any fluorine uh, involved in the organic reactions because fluorine is a uh, it's quite special. It has some abnormal behavior. Uh, usually in DSE, we try to uh, skip it. We try to not talk about it. Uh, before in A level, we did talk about the abnormal behavior of fluorine and we try to uh, explain it. But here, DSE, we try to avoid it. Just pretend that we, we never talk about it. Okay? So, fluorine, if you're really interested, you can ask me. But um, simply, we won't make any floral alkane from alcohol. Okay. Now let's look at another method to accomplish the substitution reaction. So here we use something called phosphorus trihalide, PX three. Phosphorus, you know, Peter trihalide. So three of them. So PX three. Now this one is a molecular substance. Is uh, covalent bond. P and X are COVID, covalently bonded. Okay. So here, um, if you try to produce a coral alkane, the method is simple. We can simply react with liquid phosphorus trichloride, then to accomplish the reaction. We don't even have to heat it. Okay. So the, always it is easier to make coral alkane than bromo alkane and aldo alkane, right? So you just add it together and voila, it's done. Okay. Now, here if you want to prepare bromo and iodo alkane, then the reaction will be more uh, demanding. Like I said, uh, bromine, iodine, these guys are usually not very stable. Okay. Especially when they form a compound, they usually want to decompose. And so here, what we try to do is we will again prepare the PBr3 and the Pi3 in situ. So again, we don't have a PBr3, we don't have a Pi3 already prepared at the first place. We always prepare it in situ. Okay? So you see, uh, we will have phosphorus, which is a solid, bromine, which is a liquid, aldehyde is a solid, but probably 
uh, we dissolve it in organic solvent. Okay, um, we will add these together next to the alcohol, so it will first forming B uh, PBr3, and then subsequently they undergo the substitution reaction. Okay, so this is the idea. Now uh, there was a extra question that I that I have uh, created, which is related to uh, the reaction. Let me find it. Okay, this one. So this is a setup to show you how to produce uh, bromoalkane from phosphorus tribromide. So it's a quite a complicated setup. So you see, but that gives you a more authentic idea. Now you see, uh, we have the propane one mole, and then down here we have the red phosphorus. Okay, we put together, there's no reaction down here. And then we have uh, addition funnel, or dropping funnel, and inside we fill with bromine, okay? So this one probably uh, is not elemental bromine, it's probably bromine dissolved in some kind of organic solvent. Okay, and then uh, what we do is we actually uh, add the bromine from the dropping bottle into the container. So the bromine will first react with the red phosphorus, forming the phosphorus tribromide, and then immediately the phosphorus tribromide reacts with the propane one mole, forming the bromo uh, one bromopropane. Okay, so this is the idea. Uh, the reason why we try to uh, prepare the distillation, or we call it heat under reflux, is that first of all the reaction requires heating, and secondly, uh, we don't want anything to. I mean, I mean, first of all, it is requiring heating, and we don't any, we don't want any product to escape from the container. And that's why we need to prepare the condenser. Okay. Plus, again, the reaction liberating. Uh, if you look at the reaction. It may liberate, uh, uh, not the case here, but there is a chance. Hmm. Anyway, I think the main major reason why we have to set up that one is because it requires heating and the condenser. We try to avoid any reactant or product from evaporating out. Okay. All right. So. Right here, you see this method is applicable for both uh, RCL, RBR, and RI. So actually, we have two choices. For me, I suggest this one, okay? This one is more versatile. This one, not much, okay? But you need to know, but you need to know, okay? All right, now, so we talk about combustion and uh, substitution. The third one is called dehydration. Now dehydration, so in Chinese, it's quite obvious. So we try to remove a water, remove a water. But, but the definition of dehydration reaction is not simply a reaction that removes water because um, by removing water, that means the, the compound has water inside, and then you remove it. But you know, if a compound has water, then wouldn't it be a mixture rather than a compound? Because water itself is also a compound, right? You, you, you can't have a compound inside having another compound. It's, it's quite weird, right? But um, so, so how do we understand dehydration? Now, the idea is that Dehydration is actually a reaction where we try to remove hydrogen atom and oxygen atom from a compound. And we remove the hydrogen atom and oxygen atom in a 2 to 1 ratio. Okay, so we take away two hydrogen atom, take away one oxygen atom, and guess what? The two hydrogen atom and oxygen atom will form a water and they will be eliminated in the form of water. So this is how we understand dehydration. Okay, it is a reaction to remove hydrogen atom and oxygen atom in a two to one ratio, um, and uh, they will be 
they will be converted into water as the product, as one of the products. Okay, so this is how we understand dehydration reaction. So uh, down here, whenever we have to do dehydration, we need to have uh, we will have to use either dehydrating agents or we use a catalyst. So again, there are two ways. So dehydrating agent you can use corn sulfuric acid or corn phosphoric acid. And always remember, always remember, whenever you want to undergo dehydration, you must heat it. You must heat it. Okay? So here we use corn sulfuric acid, we heat it, so you will take away the hydrogen and oxygen, and it will give rise to an alkene. An alkene. Now, how does it work? So let me show you. Now I just copied this alcohol here. Okay, so like I said, uh, dehydration is to eliminate hydrogen atom and oxygen atom in 2 to 1 ratio. In this case, we will take away the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen atom. So this two will form an H2O and then it is gone. And it is gone. So what happens when the compound has lost an OH and lost an H? Then this carbon will be connected to three uh, atoms only, so as this carbon, which is which is highly unstable. So that's why they will have to establish a CC double bond in order to uh, have all the C, uh, all the carbon atoms forming four covalent bonds. So this is the idea. Whew. Okay, so um, this is the reaction. Um, Sometimes I would, I would feel like dehydration reaction is like the reverse of addition reaction because this time one product, sorry, one reactant forming two products, okay, forming the alkene, okay. Now, down here, catalytic dehydration. So this time we don't add a dehydrating agent, instead we add a catalyst. So usually we will use aluminum oxide or we will use pumice stone. Pumice stone is um, something that is rich with aluminum oxide, okay? But it also has a lot of pores that allows a greater surface area, okay? So this one, again, we have to heat it, uh, but this time we use the catalyst instead of a dehydrating agent, okay? Now look at this setup. Does it look familiar? It does, right? So this one is a setup that we also use in Cracking, cracking, catalytic cracking. And you may also realize that even the catalyst is the same. Okay? We use a ceramic wool or rock cell to soak the propanol. Okay? And then uh, we will heat the catalyst most of the time, maybe occasionally heat the uh, ceramic wool. And then once the propanol get vaporized, it will slowly pass along the aluminum oxide. And this is where the dehydration takes place, and it will form um, the propene as well as the water vapor. So the propene will be collected by water displacement, and you will as well see a lot of uh, white mist or water droplet condensed in the inner tube. That is the formation of water. That is the, an evidence for the formation of water. Okay, so that's the idea. If you ask me which one is better, um, I think they are very similar, so you better memorize both, okay? So this one is dehydration. Okay, now, before we talk about oxidation, oxidation is a long story, so let's do some practice questions, shall we? Again, there are some, um, we will say conversion type of question, so you need to deduce the organic product. Now, this time, I only want you to put down the organic product. So any inorganic product, you don't have to show, okay? Only the organic product. So uh, again, pause the video, attempt the question, and then we will check the answers, okay? Okay, let's get started. Um, we have uh, a secondary alcohol, propentuol, red phosphorus, bromine, heat. So it's gonna be a substitution reaction where it forms 
to bromyl propane. Okay. Then here we have corn hydrochloric acid. We have two hydroxyl groups, so probably we will undergo the substitution reaction twice to form a 1,2-dipolar propane. Okay. And here we have an ethanol. We have aluminum oxide. We will heat it. This one is probably a dehydration reaction forming ethene. Okay. And this one we have corn sulfuric acid. We heat it. So this one is probably a dehydration reaction. Now, but if you are smart, you realize that there are two possible products because think about it. It depends on whether the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen on the left here to be removed it or the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen atom from the right is removed it. If you remove this hydrogen atom and this hydroxyl group, it will have a bu one e It will form bu one e right? bu one e If it is the hydroxyl group here and the hydrogen atom from this carbon being removed it, it will form bu two e So these are the two possible products, okay? And it will be best if you include both. Okay. Now you may ask, okay, so um, is there any like Makonikov rules that determines which one is the major product? Well, yes, it does. Uh, in fact, in this case, this one should be the major product. Okay, this one should be the major product. That one is uh, governed by the rule called Sayzat rule. Okay, if you're interested, you can search for it. Sayzat rule. Exactly how to spell it, I forgot. Like E Z A something like that. So you can look for this one. Okay, down here this time I give you the conversion, but I want you to suggest the necessary reagent and condition. So here, this one is a dehydration reaction, right? Think about there is an H here, and then you take away the OH and H, forming the CC double bond. So this one, what reagent or condition do you need? Well, it depends on whether you want to go for the uh, uh, dehydrating agent or catalytic dehydration. So perhaps I go for the um, dehydrating agent. And the condition, remember, whenever we undergo dehydration, you must heat it. You must heat it. So here, uh, OH and I, we were trying to do a substitution reaction. Um, like I said, I will usually go for the phosphorus trihalide. So here I will use red phosphorus, and then iodine, and then you need to heat it. Okay, and here, this one, we have a, a alcohol and it forms a CC double bond. This one is also a dehydration, so this time, I guess I will use a catalytic dehydration. Or you can as well use this one, it doesn't matter. Okay, now, next question. So which of the following reaction actually requires heating? So some requires, some do not. So the first one here, it does not require heating. This one requires heating, this one does not. So the answer is B, okay? Now, of course, if you look at the notes, this will be easy, but if that is an exact question, it could be quite challenging. But don't worry, guys. Um, once I finish covering all the reactions with organic chemistry, I will tell you which type of reaction requires heating, which type does not. Okay? I will do a, some sort of summary uh, once we cover all the, all the reactions. Now, here we have two compounds, right? Um, we have here methanol, sorry, ethanol, and then we have an ether. So, state the shape, uh, name the shape of this ether molecule. Now, not, not to name this one is to name the shape, okay? Now, you know, this one is actually like this, right? The oxygen is connected to the two methyl groups. And whenever we talk about the shape, we need to know the central atom, the central atom. And 
this one. I'm not sure if you realize that it actually looks like water, H2O, right? Imagine water having the two H atom replaced by the two methyl groups, then it will be the, the ether molecule. So remember oxygen has two lone pairs. So this one will make it adopting a tetrahedral framework. A tetrahedral framework. Okay? But of course, when we talk about the shape, we will only focus on the, um, the bond pair, not the lone pair. So this one will give you a V shape. V shape. Okay? Alright? And then, explain the difference in bonding points of the two compounds. So, uh, should be quite obvious. So first of all, the boiling point, of course, ethanol has a higher boiling point than ether. Okay? So the reason is because you need to measure about a type of intermolecular force, the major type of intermolecular force. Here it has hydrogen bond, here it has Van der Waals force only. Okay? And you need to mention about hydrogen bond is stronger than when the Waals force. Okay, so this is the idea. And here, uh, with the aid of a diagram, why the ether is soluble in water. So this one, basically, we try to show the formation of hydrogen bond between the ether and the water. So ether like this you need to show the long pair the water and this is the hydrogen bond okay partial negative partial positive partial positive partial positive partial negative partial positive okay so we need to explain as well this is because CH3 OCH3 is able to form hydrogen bond with water molecule. Okay? So this is how you explain with the aid of a diagram. Okay? Alright, now let's enter in the main dish. Okay, oxidation. The last reaction of alkano. Now, first of all, in organic chemistry, with a lot of carbon atoms, hydrogen atom, oxygen atom, blah blah blah, uh, it's quite difficult to look at the oxidation number. Actually, in organic chemistry, we, we don't always rely on the uh, change in oxidation number in order to tell whether it is an oxidation or reduction. Okay? Uh, like I said, difficult to count the oxidation number and actually there, another reason is because not all the carbon atoms have the same oxidation number. So by finding the average oxidation number, it's not quite fair. Okay? Um, instead, we sometimes can rely on the change in oxygen atom or the change in hydrogen atom in order to deduce whether it is an oxidation reaction or the reduction reaction, something like that. Okay, so now here, all we need to know is if a compound undergo oxidation, it will gain oxygen atom and or lose hydrogen atom. So we make use of the change in O and H. Now I just want to see here. Um, we have, do you remember? We have four different types of alcohol or three types. Uh, depending on whether you want to group these two together. Let's just say four types. Now, first of all, let me remind you, we will be looking at the hydroxyl carbon. We will be looking at how many AQ groups, AQ groups are attached to the hydroxyl carbon. So, all this name can be derived, can be determined from the number of AQ groups attached to the hydroxyl carbon. Okay, and here you may notice for primary alcohol, let's just say primary alcohol, 
You notice when they undergo reaction, it can form two different products. It can form aldehyde, it can also form uh, is a carboxylic acid. Okay, now let's look at it one by one. Now, if you try to compare this two, uh, if you try to compare this two, now we don't have to look at the methyl group because it doesn't change. When you look at this part and this part, so how many oxygen atoms are here? How many hydrogen atoms are here? And so for this one. Now you notice here it has one oxygen atom and three hydrogen atoms, right? And over here we have the same number of oxygen atom, but it has one uh, it has only one hydrogen atom left. So you see from here to here the reaction results in the loss of two hydrogen atoms, and therefore, according to what we mentioned here, it belongs to oxidation reaction. Okay, so this is the reason why. Uh, changing from alcohol to aldehyde is considered as oxidation reaction, okay? Because two hydrogen atoms has been removed there. Okay? Now it turns out that this the reaction doesn't stop here. So once the alcohol undergo oxidation to form ethanol, ethanol can undergo further oxidation to form ethanoic acid. So again, you try to check the number of atoms between the two uh, compounds, you realize that um, from ethanol to ethanoic acid, it has an extra oxygen atom. Okay, so this is also considered as an oxidation. So you may realize that for primary alcohol and methyl alcohol, they can undergo two-step oxidation. Two-step oxidation. So oxidation and then oxidation. Okay, here minus two H, here plus an oxygen. Okay, so both of them are considered as oxidation. Similar idea for methyl alcohol. Okay. Now, the so secondary alcohol, you see that uh, originally we have one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atom, and now it becomes one oxygen atom only. So it has taken away two hydrogen atom. So this is again the reason why uh, changing from secondary alcohol to a keto is considered as oxidation reaction okay now remember for secondary alcohol because the hydroxyl carbon is sandwiched between two aq groups therefore it will form a ketone now for primary alcohol it will form an aldehyde instead because the c double bond o is at the terminal of a chain but here the co double bond is sandwiched is in between the chain okay so bear in mind Primary alcohol from aldehyde, secondary alcohol from ketone. Okay? Now, can the ketone further oxidize to form ethanoic acid? Well, it can't because think about it. If you want to put the OH into the carbonyl carbon, then you know there will be five bonds in total. So therefore ketone can no longer undergo further oxidation. Okay? It stops here. And lastly, for tertiary alcohol, sorry, it has no reaction, it has no, I mean, in other words, tertiary alcohol cannot undergo oxidation, it is resistant to oxidation. Um, the reason is again very simple, think about uh, when this hydroxyl carbon is having a CO double bond, CO double bond, then it will have five bonds, right? So this is the reason why it cannot undergo oxidation. Okay, so now you realize, you realize one thing guys, um, like I said, it's important to know how to classify the alcohol into different uh, type, because different types of alcohol, they react differently in oxidation. Primary alcohol can undergo two-step oxidation, secondary alcohol, one-step oxidation to form ketone, tertiary alcohol, not undergoing oxidation. Okay, so even though they have the same functional group, they react differently. Okay, now down here, what are the typical type of oxidizing agent? Now, because it's an oxidation, right? You need an oxidizing agent to oxidize the organic compound. So these two, very familiar, right? So acetylated potassium dichromate solution and 
center bottom potassium permanganate solution. The half equation is given, the color change is given, so uh, just sort of refresh your memory. And uh, one more thing, guys, uh, because you know, alcohol, uh, despite it is a little bit uh, polar, it is a polar, uh, miscible with water, but if you have a larger alcohol, it's still not very miscible with water. Plus the fact that organic reactions are usually slower than inorganic reactions. So this is the reason why uh, this oxidizing agent, actually in real practice, we will use concentrated. We will use concentrated potassium dichromate, concentrated potassium permanganate solution, okay? Just to speed up the reaction. Okay, uh, down here, this is uh, like a summary, okay? Ah, you may notice, despite of having two uh, different oxidizing agents, but when you check these uh, diagrams, you realize, um, if you use potassium dichromate, it can undergo a one-step oxidation to form aldehyde, it can, then the aldehyde can undergo a second oxidation to form carboxylic acid. That means with potassium dichromate, you can form aldehyde from alcohol. You can as well form carboxylic acid from alcohol. Okay. However, if you use potassium permanganate, because potassium permanganate is a stronger oxidizing agent than dichromate, so this one will oxidize alcohol all the way to carboxylic acid. In other words. If you want to make aldehyde from alcohol, you can only use dichromate. You should never use permanganate because you can't produce aldehyde. Okay? Now, for secondary alcohol, it doesn't matter because no matter which one you use, it will oxidize into a ketone and that's it. Okay? For tertiary alcohol, there, are, there is no reaction. Okay? So that's the idea. Um, now, here, I want to focus on the first one because usually the question uh, talk about the first one, the, 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 sec, the, uh, the, the primary alcohol. So uh, sometimes we want to form aldehyde, sometimes we want to form carboxylic acid. If your objective is to make carboxylic acid, which oxidizing agent should you use? Of course, you go for permanganate. Okay, you go for potassium permanganate, and if you are intended to use aldehyde, then you must go for the dichromate. But not only use the dichromate, but you also need to carefully carry out the experiment. Because if you want to make aldehyde, then you want to avoid further oxidation. So by any means necessary, you want to avoid aldehyde to undergo further oxidation. On the other hand, okay, if you are given uh, dichromate only, but you are asked to make carboxylic acid, then you should figure out how to ensure a double oxidation take place. You want to make sure every single aldehyde is further oxidized to carboxylic acid. So um, you need to make sure uh, what compounds are you making, and then you need to select and improvise uh, how you actually carry out the experiment. Now, so on the right hand side here, the, this two setup is to show you uh, how to prepare aldehyde and how to prepare carboxylic acid if you have a potassium dichromic solution. Okay? Now, this one is to produce carboxylic acid. So, the carboxylic acid, our key issue is make sure, okay, all aldehyde is oxidized it to carboxylic acid. Okay, this is our main objective, right? Make sure all aldehyde is oxidized to carboxylic acid. Okay, so what we do is we carry out a setup called heat under reflux. Now this is a very important setup, we call it heat under Reflux. Okay. Sorry. Heat under reflux. Now, 
What do you mean by heat under reflux? Now think about it. Uh, did you make soup at home before? Like the Chinese soup, not the not the Western soup. Or oh, at least you see your mom, okay, do uh, making the soup, right? And usually we have to boil the soup for like one or two hours. And uh, the longer you boil it, the more intensive the flavor is. Simply because you uh, evaporate more and more water, so the soup become more concentrated, right? This is also the reason why if you go to Cha Chan Tan, usually the, the soup there is more salty at night because the water has been uh, evaporated, so they are more salty, right? <clears throat> now, but this is the case for making soup. You want the water to go away so that your soup get more flavorful. But do you want the water or probably your product getting removed it? as you heat it? Of course not. You want to keep the reactant and product inside the container. However, for organic substance, they are known to be quite volatile. Right? Alcohol is volatile, LDI is even more volatile. So when you heat it, um, it is very likely that they will vaporize. So then you may ask, hey sir, easy, huh? I just stop her, stop her the flask. And then heat it. Well, this is again not a good idea because when you stop the flask, then you will have a closed system. And when you heat a closed system, the air inside expand, and there is a chance where the stopper get popped out, or you may crack the glassware. So always remember, you never heat a closed system. Okay, you never heat a closed system. So the question is, how can we offer an open system? but at the same time, prevent our reactant and product from evaporating out. This is how we do it. This is what we call heat under reflux. That can fulfill what we want. So here we have a PHA flask or whatever container we have. Uh, we will put the ethanol, acetabinic potassium dichromic solution, anti-pumping granules, and we will heat it in a water bath. And at the top, we have a condenser where the water in and out is uh, floating, is operating. So what we are trying to do is to heat it for a long time. Now why do we have to heat it for a long time? Because we need to make sure all the aldehyde is oxidized into carboxylic acid. So of course, the longer the time the organic uh, substance is staying together with the oxidizing agent, the more likely would be uh, the aldehyde being further oxidized to acid, right? So we need to hit it under reflux for a long, long time. And the condenser here prevents the vapor from leaving the condenser because when the vapor goes up, they will condense at the inner tubing and then flow back to the uh, react reaction mixture. So this is what we call heat under reflux. Okay. So here, the advantage of heat under reflux is to allow continuous heating without the loss of reactant or product. Okay, so this is very important. Heat under reflux. Okay? And ethanol has a much lower boiling point. Uh, so this is the reason why we must have a condenser. Okay? Otherwise the ethanol will all be gone. Then we can't make sure all the aldehyde is oxidized to carboxylic acid. Okay? And then this one is the setup for oxidizing alcohol to aldehydes. Now again, if you want to make aldehydes, what is your major concern? You need to make sure, okay, uh, no aldehyde is oxidized to carboxylic acid. So in other words, you try to avoid, you try to avoid further oxidation. You try to avoid further oxidation. So how do we achieve this? Now, first of all, think about it. If I go back to the heat under reflux, if you want to ensure uh, the ethanol is oxidized it into carboxylic acid, should we use limited or excess? potassium dichromic solution. 
Of course, you use excess, right? You want to make sure at any point of time the aldehyde can be exposed to the dichromate ions. Okay, so that will greatly increase the chance of further oxidation. So you use excess here. However, if you do not want any aldehyde to undergo further oxidation, you should never use excess. You want to ensure uh, every single time it is a very limiting amount of uh, dichromic is added into large amount of alcohol so that that dichromic, that oxidizing agent will be quickly reacts with the alcohol and forming the aldehyde, right? Okay, so this is the reason why this setup is designed as such that the dichromic solution is added drop by drop to the uh, ethanol so that it ensures always the dichromic is the limiting reagent. Okay, but not just like that. Uh, like I said, the reaction will produce the aldehyde, right? So if you have aldehyde here, there will still be a chance where uh, the dichromic uh, collides with the aldehyde and undergo further oxidation. So here, you notice this time, this setup actually allows the vapor to travel up along this stem and going to this condenser and then it is collected as a distillate. So this time, actually, we allow the aldehyde form to be distilled off and collected into a second into another test tube. Okay, so this one basically we can remove any aldehyde form from the mixture. Okay, so that we can prevent the aldehyde from contacting with the dichromic ions. Okay, so this one, this entire setup, we call this distillation. And this one will be used when we have to uh, synthesize aldehyde from alcohol. Okay, so this is the idea. Now let's check some key des description here. So to produce ethanol, okay, it is important to avoid further oxidation of ethanol. To do this, the dichromic solution acts slowly in dropwise manner. Also. Uh, we want to separate the ethanol by distillation. So any ethanol form will be vaporized, condensed, and collected. Okay? So we try to uh, prevent further oxidation of aldehyde by first, always adding limiting dichromic, and secondly, uh, quickly separate the aldehyde zone form by distillation. Okay? So that is the idea. Okay, so let's do some practice question. Again, you know the tricks, pause the video, do the question first, and then check. Again, you are asked to draw the organic products only. So no need to draw any other inorganic products. Okay, let's check. We have a secondary alcohol here, secondary alcohol. So dichromic, so it will form a ketone, right? It will form a ketone. Okay. And the next one, this one is a propanol, so it's a primary alcohol. We use permanganate. Of course, it will form carboxylic acid. Okay, it will form carboxylic acid. Okay. And then we have uh, cyclohexanol, hexanol, cyclohexanol. So for this one, uh, it's essentially a secondary alcohol, so it will oxidize to form a ketone, like this. Okay. And lastly, we have two hydroxyl groups. One is. Um, one is a primary alcohol, another one is a secondary alcohol. So in this case, dichromic, then of course this one will be oxidized into keto, and this one it could be oxidized to aldehyde or uh, carboxylic acid. But if it hits under reflux, it will probably form carboxylic acid. So the better answer would be this one, CH2, COOH. 
Okay, this one. Okay. All right, let's look at the multiple choice question. So which of the following reaction will produce a ketone as the major product? So the first one, 3 methylbutan 2 o with acidified potassium dichromic solution. So you need to think about whether, because if you want to form ketone, it must be a secondary alcohol. So the question is, okay, which one is a secondary alcohol? So here, um, 3 methylbutan 2 o so just draw them out if you're not sure. 2O is here, 3 methyl is here. So this is uh, a secondary alcohol, so the first one is okay. Now this, the second one, treat 2 methyl butan 2O with permanganate. So butan 2O here, 2 methyl here. So this is a sec a tertiary, this is a tertiary uh, alcohol. So it is resistant to oxidation despite using a very strong oxidizing agent. Okay, doesn't work. So actually, you know, one work, two doesn't work, you already know the answers. But look at three here. So we have Bu3E2O, treat with hydrogen gas and porous platinum. So let's draw it out. Um, we have Bu2O <coughs> and then three in, right? So this one, so this one, it reacts with hydrogen gas with platinum catalyst. This is actually an addition reaction of alkene of CC double bond. So this one, it will react to form a ketone. So that's why number three is also correct. <coughs> so I will choose B as the answer. Okay. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> sorry. Now, question three is quite demanding. Uh, it's actually a redox, balancing redox equation. Uh, this one, I try to give you the half equation for the oxidation of ethanol to ethanol and then ethanol to uh, ethanol acid. So, this is to try to uh, ask you to write a balanced ionic equation. With potassium permanganate. Um, so first of all, you need to know with permanganate, ethanol should be oxidized all the way to ethanol acid. So you will, you should be using this one as the half equation. Okay. Uh, for permanganate, uh, five electrons. So one is five, one is four. Uh, ooh, it's quite complicated. <laughs> you need to have like. Um, anyway, let's just quickly get this over. Okay, let me think. Um, let's see, uh, eight. Okay, should be like this. Okay, and then uh, next one, uh, few drops of dichromate to produce ethanol as the major product. Okay, so we were using the first one, and dichromate. Oh, dichromate is easier, so you can have.
Okay. That should be correct. Okay. All right. So the last one. <coughs> A student used the following experiment to synthesize ethanol from ethanol, but the result is unsatisfactory as the yield is very low. Now, this one, uh, what is the name of this experimental process? So you see, we have the, the container here, we have um, the condenser connected this way. This is heat under reflux. Okay? And why his yield is very low? Now, <clears throat> of course, heat under reflux is not used to make um, aldehyde. It's used to make carboxylic acid. So, but if you need to explain why, so first of all, uh, you will say that uh, because any ethanol form will undergo further oxidation with dichromate to form carboxylic acid, uh, ethanol acid in this case. So this is the reason why okay, the yield is very very low. Okay? Right, so that's the answer. All right, so uh, let's stop it here today. It has been a long lesson. Like I said, alcohol is one of the main dishes. Okay, so next lesson we will resume uh, by talking about the reaction with aldehyde ketone. So stay tuned and bye bye.